the I just would like to uh, the briefly uh, introduce Takuya. And actually, I and Takuya were former colleagues when we are the NPT. Good crowd down there. <laughs> oh, until you left, so it was 2011, 12. Yeah. Yes. And then since then, uh, they, he moved to the uh, Microsoft, and then now uh, the, the principal uh, research manager. And he has been actually working on the quite uh, wide range of the speech processing. But mostly, the, uh, as I mentioned, multi-speaker processing, uh, distance, uh, the speech recognition, and so on. And one of the uh, well-known techniques is the weighted prediction error, which is a deliberation technique, which used to be used in the first version of the uh, Google Home and so on. And he also has a great achievement uh, in the Chime 3 challenge. His team uh, got the, uh, the best uh, the performance and actually large margin to the second uh, best team. And actually second best team is our team. <laughs> so <laughs> at that time I already moved to the other company. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, I just would like to uh, welcome Sakia and uh, please start your presentation. Uh. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Shinji, uh, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about our work. And hello, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to my talk. So today I'd like to talk about our work on natural conversation transcription, or more simply, meeting transcription that we have been working on my, at Microsoft for the last three to four years. And uh, especially, I'd like to talk about two specific approaches. Uh, one is uh, continuous speech separation, and the second one is end-to-end -end speaker attributed speech recognition. So that's uh, the topic of my talk. And let me start the presentation. Can everybody hear in the back? No? Um, okay. Uh, 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 can you hear? This Is this better? All right. Okay. So then uh, I'll do this way. <laughs> All right, so before diving into the uh, content of the talk, I'd just like to mention that uh, this is a, a collab, uh, compilation of a lot of work done uh, by our team and also some collaborators, uh, the current uh, full-time members of Microsoft and also the current and past interns that we have. Uh, and uh, I guess some of you may know uh, some of the people listed here. All right. And uh, before diving into the details of conversation transcription, I just, uh, I'd like to uh, put uh, our work into context. So as you know, speech recognition uh, is uh, widely used in many different applications right now. And uh, the accuracy has been improving over the past decade uh, gradually. And uh, it's, uh, every year it is becoming better and better. And uh, because of the technology improvement, of, uh, thanks to the, a lot of uh, innovations happening in the research community, and at the same time, uh, at companies, uh, we also develop a lot of training data every year, which also contribute to the performance improvement. And uh, so uh, it was clear that uh, speech recognition is going to become a, a very important uh, thing. And then so we think about, uh, so a couple of years ago, we thought about what can we do next beyond the speech recognition. And the uh, ultimate goal uh, probably would be uh, what we call scene understanding. Uh, if you think about uh, how we humans perceive the acoustic scene, and actually we also get information from vision, but uh, we also get, we get a lot of information in addition to just the text information that can be captured as a uh, as speech recognition. For example, if you're having conversation with uh, other people, you can immediately tell uh, who the speaker is if you know these people, and you can immediately tell when the speaker changed from one person to another. Also, uh, for example, because you have two ears, uh, most of the people can actually tell where the audio is coming from. Maybe uh, speaker A is sitting over there and speaker B is sitting over, uh, uh, to the right of my side, uh, things like that. And also you have some, a lot of information, not only for speech, but also some acoustic environment, like uh, what kind of uh, noise do you have in the acoustic space? So you have many, uh, you can uh, actually, a human can actually acquire many information from the scene understanding perspective. 
And uh, so toward the out that ultimate goal, uh, so uh, from our point of view, we decided to work on this natural conversation transcription or meeting transcription, which is essentially uh, uh, try to uh, transcribe uh, what's being said uh, by whom. So that is the definition of natural conversation transcription, and it clearly has a bit of value. So that's another reason uh, for us to start working in this space. And uh, if you think about the transition from just speech recognition to uh, conversation transcription, there are a couple of things that need to be done. And the first element is uh, obviously speaker labeling. So if you have multiple people talking to each other, uh, it's much better to be able to tell who the speaker is for each utterance, transcribed utterance. So without speaker labeling, it's really hard to comprehend what's being said uh, by looking at on only the transcriptions. So that's one aspect of uh, uh, speaker, uh, sorry, uh, conversation transcription. And another thing is obviously overlap speech recognition. And uh, in some cases, in natural conversation, multiple people may speak over each other and you have overlap speech. Uh, I mean, uh, two or three people are talking at the same time. And uh, this, is just, this actually happens uh, from time to time. And this is just an example uh, from the last, uh, uh, last presidential debates, uh, which I have no political intention, but uh, this is a very good example of, uh, of overlap speech. So I just wanted to, I don't know whether I can play back the audio here. Uh, okay. It seems that the audio is not coming out. Okay, maybe I can skip it. Uh, if you're interested, I can share it with you later. By the way, so so uh, that's another point. Uh, all right, so, uh, so and then uh, these two things uh, uh, lead us to this diagram, uh, which shows uh, basically three uh, important components of uh, conversation transcription. The first component speech, uh, obviously speech recognition, uh, and the second component speaker diarization, uh, and the third component speech separation or overlap speech recognition. And uh, actually what needs to be done uh, in when it's come to real application, uh, we need to work on this intersection of all these three areas. But uh, most of the people have been working on the isolated uh, area like for speech recognition and speaker direction, speech separation. And that's the perspective uh, that we wanted to have in our work so that, uh, for example, when we develop speech separation system, uh, we wanted to make a solution that can be directly used for, to improve the speech recognition or speaker direction for dealing with overlap speech. And uh, along that uh, line of thinking, we uh, develop a couple of different methods uh, to this problem. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, two of them. Uh, the first approach is basically modular approach, and the second one is joint approach. And the modular approach, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, what we are calling continuous speech separation, uh, which is a, a front-end-based approach, where we do, you do uh, 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 transform the input signal into some separated signal uh, so that uh, downstream tasks like speech recognition can automatically apply it to the uh, output signal of the continuous speech separation module. And uh, for this, I talk about both monorail speech separation and uh, microphone array-based speech separation. And uh, for the microphone array-based speech separation, I like to briefly mention about our recent work on array geometry agnostic modeling. And the second area is joint approach, where we try to uh, combine these three elements in a single model and uh, jointly optimize all the, everything together so that we can, uh, we can achieve the best performance possible. So these are the two things I'd like to talk about today. All right, and then so let me go into the first one, modular approach. All right, so, so uh, let me spend some time, uh, maybe five minutes, to talk about the basics of speech separation. Uh, <clears throat> and speech separation, uh, the task of speech separation can be defined as follows. And so as an input, you have a mixture signal of multiple speakers. 
as you can hear, uh, as shown in this diagram, you may have two speakers uh, talking uh, to each other, and uh, you have a mixture of them as an input. And uh, you have some speech separation model. Uh, maybe uh, typically it is a neural net based model. And uh, you give uh, this uh, mixture signal to this neural net model. And the model is asked to produce uh, the underlying speech signals for speaker A and speaker B. So that is a task of speech separation. And so uh, the most popular way to do speech, uh, speaker, sorry, speech separation is uh, based on uh, something called time frequency masking. So in the time frequency masking approach, uh, we typically use a uh, short time Fourier transformed uh, STFT to transform the signal, the one dimensional waveform signal into two dimensional representation, uh, which basically describe the energy distribution uh, across the time and the frequency of the incoming audio, which clearly captures the acoustic uh, characteristic of the input signal. And then uh, you give this uh, power spectrum uh, representation or time frequency representation of the input signal to the uh, neural, net, uh, neural net model, which uh, try to estimate something called time frequency mask. And the time frequency mask uh, basically, so, uh, so I have TF mask for speaker one, speaker two, as shown. Oh, oh, oh wait a minute here. Okay, uh, the cursor doesn't show up. It's fine. So uh, on, the, uh, on, on the upper side, I have the branch for speaker A, and on the lower side, I have branch for speaker B. Okay. This is, uh, okay, okay, all right. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, here I have the branch for speaker one, and here uh, I have the branch for speaker two. And uh, on the uh, speaker one side, uh, what, what is estimated is that, so basically in this time frequency representation, uh, you can clearly, because of the sparsity of the speech, represent, uh, speech energy distribution, uh, you tend to have uh, time frequency beams that are dominated by the speaker one, and uh, the other uh, time frequency beams are dominated by speaker two. So what you want to do is to tell which time frequency beams are dominated by uh, speaker one. And uh, that's this time frequency mask, basically, uh, that's this classification task. And then once you get this time frequency mask, uh, which uh, gives you uh, zero, uh, the value between zero and one uh, for each TF uh, time frequency point, you just multiply it with the incoming audio so that you can extract the speaker one's energy component. And the same applies to speaker B. So that's how this time frequency mask based uh, speech separation. And uh, because this is neural net based approach, uh, you need a training data set uh, when uh, you train the model. And uh, for each training sample, uh, so, so first of all, each training sample is usually constructed by uh, computer simulation. So you have a clean speech signal for speaker one, you, you have clean speech signal for speaker two, and uh, for, uh, you mix them together on the computer so that uh, you not only have the mixture signal, but also have uh, speaker one and speaker two reference signals. And then, so now uh, what you want to do is to compare your uh, model output with the reference signals. And because the model produced in this case two speaker signals, and uh, you also have two reference signals, you want to compare these two, two sets of uh, signals. But you don't know which, uh, for example, whether output signal one corresponds to uh, reference one or reference two. Uh, so, it, so there is some ambiguity in terms of this uh, this uh, comparison. And uh, the permutation, something called permutation invariant training was developed to solve this problem. And the idea here is that, uh, so uh, because you don't know uh, the right permutation of the reference, so what you do is to consider all the possible permutation of the reference and uh, calculate the loss function. In this case, loss function is a mean squared error between your reference and output and then uh, pick the permutation that gives the best loss function value. And then you drive the uh, backpropagation uh, process uh, from that point, and then you can update the model parameters. So that is the permutation variant training. And, and also there are some people working on uh, what's called end-to-end -end speech separation. 
And uh, instead of using, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last diagram, I showed, uh, I said that the input is time frequency representation, and also the output is a time frequency representation. So instead, uh, we can consider uh, replacing this uh, STFT uh, and uh, inverse STFT uh, with the neural net based encoder and decoder. And they join it together, uh, this encoder and decoder, the time frequency mask is made uh, to, uh, uh, to, to improve this uh, separation quality. So that's the end-to-end uh, -end speed separation. And this has been successful as well. And so this is just uh, the evolution of the methods uh, that have been developed over the past four to five years in the space of speed separation. And uh, this is a result on a bench, the most popular and simple benchmarking test set uh, called WST or 2 mix. So uh, you have, so this is a simulated data set uh, where uh, you mix uh, two utterances taken from the Wall Street Journal data set, and then uh, tell, uh, ask the network to produce uh, the separate three signals and calculate the signal to distortion ratio, STR. And uh, the original version uh, produced uh, STR uh, improvement of zero, uh, sorry, 5.9 dB. But uh, over time, uh, people uh, came up with a new idea. And uh, recently, I guess the best number are between uh, 22 or 23, uh, 23 dB. So it's incredible improvement. So that's the basics of speed separation. And so, all right, so then, so the question now is, all right, so we have a very good speed separation model, uh, apparently. So how can we use that technology to really solve the problem of meeting transcription, for example, uh, the overlap problem in the meeting transcription? And if you think about meeting transcription, the input is a really long form audio because you don't have any segmentation. So if your meeting is like a 30 minutes, you have a 30 minute equivalent of audio. And then you put this long form audio into your system. And uh, if you look at the uh, long form audio, there may be some overlap segments, but there are some other segments where only one person or zero person is talking. So as shown here, uh, in, this, in this case, speaker one, the first speaker starts speaking initially, and then after that, speaker two starts uh, speaking uh, uh, when the speaker one finished. And then toward the end of the utterance, uh, speaker one tried to uh, interrupt, uh, interrupt this person and then uh, took the term, speaking term uh, from this person. And so, uh, so that you have some overlap speech area here. And then uh, this person continues to talk. And then toward the end, you may again have some overlap region. So this is a very typical overlap, uh, how the overlap happens in real meetings. And you may also have some uh, short uh, overlap segments because of, for example, laughter and uh, uh, back channel and these, uh, these uh, vocal, fact, uh, vocal uh, activities. So that is the actual problem uh, that happens in real uh, meeting transcription. And uh, in order to do that, so uh, there can be multiple ways we can think about uh, to apply the uh, speed separation technology. One simple way would be to, because we, we now have a speed separation system that can deal with multiple speakers here, so why not uh, we detect overlap region in advance uh, so by using some overlap detection model then uh, we can do speech separation, and then we could do ASR. Uh, ASR refers to uh, automatic speech recognition. But the problem is that this overlap uh, may happen at a random occasion, and uh, we cannot tell actually when this happens, and, uh, and uh, this may, if you just uh, cut the audio at the overlap segment, you may end up with uh, uh, basically uh, splitting audio at just some middle point of an utterance or a speaker, so which is not good for both ASR and speaker diarization realization. So that uh, doesn't seem to be a good way. And the next approach, which is actually popular in many uh, challenge tasks like uh, Chime 5 and Chime, no, Chime 6, uh, uh, is a speaker direction driven approach. So, uh, which is good for offline processing actually. Uh, so you start with speaker diarization so you have a long form audio, and uh, uh, you can do speaker diarization, to tell, 
let's say speaker A uh, speaks uh, this region in this region, region and speaker B speaks uh, from uh, this region to this region. And then you try to do uh, speech recognition with speaker, uh, speech recognition and speech suppression at the same time for each region. So that is a speaker derivation based approach. And uh, it actually works for offline scenario, but it really it, it is really hard to apply this in a streaming audio uh, streaming processing, which is also important in real applications, because essentially speaker derivation is uh, uh, how do you say you need a global view of the entire audio in order to tell the speaker characteristics, a speaker classification, but speech separation is uh, just a local process, uh, local phenomenon. Uh, so, from my point of view, derivation is more difficult than separation, uh, especially for uh, streaming processing. And if you remember uh, the uh, this philosophy behind this uh, discriminatory training or uh, uh, support vector machines, which says when solving a problem of interest, you should not solve a more general problem as an intermediate step. So, to me, it sounds like uh, this derivation-based approach sounds like a kind of conflicting with that uh, uh, approach. So we wanted to think about some different way. So, but uh, from that thinking, basically what we want uh, for the modular approach is a method that just focuses on overlap speech. And uh, we do not care about speaker labeling at this point, or speech recognition. We just focus on overlap speech, and uh, in order to solve that problem, we develop an idea called continuous speech separation. And uh, continuous speech separation, is, uh, uh, let me explain what it is. So you have a long form audio uh, from the meeting uh, uh, at the input, and you have this CSS module. CSS refers to continuous speech separation. And uh, it always produces uh, a fixed number of outputs. Uh, in our case, most of the time, we set it two. So, and uh, this uh, fixed number of outputs uh, determines how many simultaneous speakers you can, uh, you can deal with. And uh, in real meetings, uh, even if you have, let's say, 20 or 30 people in the same room, it never happens for 20, all the 20 speakers to talk to uh, talk at the same time, right? If you look at the very local time slice, uh, most of the time you see only one or two people are talking. And uh, so, so you don't need to deal with like uh, 15 to 20 people at the same time. You just need to uh, deal with only one or two speakers. So that's the basic key idea uh, behind this CSS thing. And uh, so how it works is as follows. So when there is only one speaker in the input, you just uh, uh, do some enhancement uh, for that speaker and route that signal to one of the output channels, in this case, output channel one. And if you have uh, overlap segments, uh, for example, this second speaker uh, starts speaking uh, before the first speaker uh, uh, finishes. So uh, you do some, some speech separation and uh, route that speaker, uh, route that utterance to the remaining channel uh, because, because you wanted to separate this signal from this signal. And uh, so for this person, uh, this person started after this person finished. So it doesn't matter where you put this audio to uh, channel one or channel two. Uh, it, can, it kind of random. And then uh, you have, again, speaker one uh, speaking, uh, saying something else uh, from, uh, from the first utterance. And again, you have overlap segments, but this time, uh, because the output channel one is already occupied by this person, uh, you need to assign, uh, you need to use the second output channel uh, in this case. So as you can see, so uh, it, actually we do not care where the, each speaker goes to in terms of output channel assignment. Uh, in some cases, uh, this speaker goes to output channel one. In, some ca in other cases, uh, this, output, uh, this person goes to other output channel two. The only focus is just dealing with the overall problem. And if you look at individual output channels, so you can see that uh, there is no overlap uh, within, uh, uh, inside the signal. So you can directly apply, uh, for example, speech recognition or speaker derivation, uh, existing speech recognition algorithms to do speak speech recognition and then merge the transcribed words uh, at the end. So which is super simple uh, to, do, uh, to deal with the overlap problem. So uh, that is the concept of uh, continuous speech separation. And there are at least, as far as I know, two ways to, uh, to realize this idea. 
One is simpler one, uh, using sliding window. Another one is more toward end-to-end -to -end approach. But I like to talk about uh, only the sliding window-based approach uh, today. And with the sliding based, window based approach, what you do, is, so it's very simple. You have a red uh, sliding window of size, in our case, 1.6 seconds, or uh, in some, sometimes we use 2.4, but uh, red with a time, uh, time limited uh, context window. And then we apply speed separation algorithm uh, within the window. And then we shift the window position a little bit. And then we do the same thing to get uh, another uh, separated signals. And just repeat this process from left to right fashion to get the output signal. And here, uh, because all this uh, separation processing happens without consideration uh, of the uh, separation before, we sometimes the output order may be swapped uh, from, the time, uh, from, the, uh, from the previous processing block. So in order to, uh, to align the output signals, uh, what we do is, because we have some overlap segments uh, between the adjacent uh, blocks, we can calculate the, uh, the, the, the differences between output signal one of the current uh, frame and output signal one of the previous, frame, uh, previous block. And, uh, and then you can calculate, you can figure out uh, whether you should flip the order of the output channel for the current one. So in that way, you have, for example, uh, you have a stream of uh, signal uh, in this way uh, to generate a long form audio, output audio. And uh, so that's the uh, sliding window based approach towards uh, CSS. It's pretty simple. Oh, and uh, another thing that I wanted to note is that uh, the key is that because uh, for each block, uh, most of the time, actually, you have only one speaker. So the network needs to produce zero signal when there is only one speaker. And this is possible by putting a lot of uh, single speaker segments in your training data set. So by doing so, uh, the network uh, automatically figure out whether uh, the uh, input audio actually contain two speakers or one speaker. And in, in the case of one speaker, it just generates zero signal. So which is pretty simple. So uh, there is some, uh, some consideration you need to put uh, for data set creation. But once you figure out how you create a data set, it's really simple. And so that is the, uh, uh, the basic idea. And uh, this can be directly applied to real meetings, like, uh, for example, AMI meetings, uh, which is a publicly available data set for meeting transcription. And also, we have, in, uh, we have collected a lot of internal meetings, um, so, uh, which is good. But at the same time, we wanted to do some analysis on the behavior of the model. So uh, we also developed a data, small data set called LibreCSS, which allows us to do some analysis, uh, uh, like, for example, the impact of the overlap ratio uh, on the final system performance. And the, the way we created the data set is as follows. So uh, LibreCSS, uh, sorry, LibreSpeech is, you know, uh, uh, is a, a clean speech utterance collection. And uh, we get the test entrances uh, from the Libre speech and concatenate them, them together with a varying overlap ratio uh, and for each speaker. And just play back the individual speaker's audio, concatenated individual speaker's audio from different loudspeakers as shown here. In, um, and we capture the audio uh, with the microphone array so that we can do evaluation for, with single microphone or multiple microphones. So that's uh, how we collected the data. And this actually supports two evaluation schemes. One is conventional utterance-based evaluation, just like WSC02 mix, which I mentioned. And also, it supports a continuous processing evaluation. And uh, we have been using this data set uh, as well. All right. And this is just um, uh, some uh, experimental results that we obtained. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Jian Wu, obtained uh, recently. And uh, on the right side, uh, on the left side, we have uh, a trans space evaluation using Oracle segmentations. And on the right side, I have the results for a continuous processing evaluation. And uh, what we did here, so the speed separation model, uh, we use a conformer based speed separation model. Uh, and uh, we experiment with different uh, loss functions like Spec loss means you calculate the uh, mean squared error in the linear uh, time frequency uh, representation. 
and feature loss means you calculate the mean square error in the male spectrum loss uh, in the male spectrum domain. And uh, in addition, you could also do a concatenated ASR module and a sequence to sequence uh, speech recursion module at the end of the separated audio, uh, so that uh, you can have a transcription for each of them. And then uh, by freezing the ASR parameters, you can guide the training of the front-end model so that uh, you can get uh, hopefully better ASR performance instead of just enhancing the audio quality. So, and uh, if you use a spec, uh, so basically this is a loss performance the best uh, for at least for the single channel evaluation uh, for both a transpace evaluation and continuous processing evaluation. So that's the results. And, uh, and also we apply the same techniques to another uh, challenge called uh, Vox SRC 2020 speaker direction challenge. The task is speaker direction. So you have uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, long form audio and uh, you want to do speaker direction. So speaker direction again uh, refers to a process of uh, finding, uh, finding the speaker homogeneous segment and then giving a speaker label. And so, so basically what we did is we have this CSS module in the front end, and then we did uh, just a D vector extraction and the speaker clustering. Speaker clustering is uh, for dilatation and some post-processing to get the dilatation result. And this is just a result for the depth set. Uh, without speech separation, we get uh, DR of 5.04%. With speech separation, we get a uh, rate, sorry, dilatation uh, error rate of 3.8. And uh, our final submitted system uses a system combination using a modified version of what was called Dover, and it achieved 3.7. So that's the, another benefit of uh, CSS. And so I, I don't know whether I can share uh, other slide. So let me, oh, okay, let me, uh, okay, probably it's, it's smoother to skip this one. So basically what I wanted to show is, uh, this is the, uh, what I wanted to show is uh, speaker, so maybe some of you, uh, many of you uh, do not know, but Microsoft Word actually has a capability of doing speech recognition, dilatation with overlap speech, and it actually works. And uh, for uh, that, uh, that uh, particular example that I wanted to show. But uh, yeah, so, the, so that's the first part. And so, I don't know. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Otherwise, okay. Um, this is very good in getting, but is there higher level information that might help, like dialogue processing and knowing that it's likely that two people might talk back and forth a little bit? Is, is there anything there that might help? Yeah, I think it might help. Uh, I don't know whether it will be helpful for uh, like uh, speech separation or speaker dilatation, but uh, definitely it should be helpful for speech recognition, for example. But uh, so far we haven't been, uh, yeah, we haven't, uh, uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't do a serious work on that. So maybe, so I know there are some people working in, for example, using, trying to use a long-term linguistic context uh, to improve the uh, uh, to language model. But uh, at this moment, uh, for example, in terms of dialogue, uh, maybe there is possible, but uh, at this moment, I don't have a good idea. But that's definitely a good point. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good point. And uh, actually, we have one paper uh, that tried to do audio visual meeting transcription. And so what we did is you have this uh, uh, hardware device that captures both uh, audio and video. Uh, and uh, this video camera uh, can capture 360, uh, 360 uh, degrees so that uh, you can capture all the directions. And uh, so we did a lot of experiments there. So at least for speaker dilatation, it's really, it, it, it was really helpful because you can tell from the video uh, where the people are sitting, right? So you know, uh, for example, 
if there are three people, uh, you know, uh, speak, uh, speaker one is in the direction of 100, direct, uh, 100 degrees, and the speaker B may be 200 degrees. And uh, by combining that information with the SS, uh, sound source localization, you can, uh, you can improve the accuracy of speaker dialization. So that's what we did. Uh, so ideally, it should be also possible to further improve the performance of speech recognition because you can, hopefully, you should be able to capture the, for example, lip movement to, uh, to further boost the performance of ASR. But uh, what we found is that uh, usually people are sitting very far from the device, because uh, when, especially when you have many people in the same room. So it's really hard in because of the low resolution. So that's, uh, we haven't been successful, but uh, that's something uh, over time, we've, uh, if the hardware becomes uh, more capable, maybe we can, uh, also, uh, that could be helpful. That's copies, right? Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> that's another factor. <laughs> all right, if not, uh, if, all right, so let me move on to the, uh, the second one. And, Okay, so uh, I talk about the single channel monorail speed separation and uh, meeting transcription. And uh, I just want to briefly mention uh, how we can extend it to multi-channel case. So with multi-channel, we have, so the scenario is like uh, we have multiple people in the same room, people are coming back to office, and uh, you have a meeting, room, a meeting device uh, in the, at the center of the microphone, for example, on a table, uh, <coughs> and uh, you have, uh, you, uh, which is equipped with multiple microphones to capture the audio. So that you can, for example, uh, you can do uh, a sound source localization, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, we can also exploit that uh, multiple, inf uh, multiple signal information to improve the performance of speed separation. And so with multiple signals, so okay, so uh, on the left side, I show, I'm showing the diagram for a single channel case where you have a single input, time frequency representation of the audio, and then you have uh, spectrum masking. And in the multi-channel case, uh, there are two things that you can improve. One is the input to the mask spatial network. So because now you have multiple signals, the simplest way is to extract the feature vectors from each microphone and then just concatenate them together uh, along the frequency axis or feature axis uh, so that you have this long, uh, uh, long, uh, lo uh, long dimensions, uh, uh, many elements in the frequency dimension. And then uh, you still have this 2D representation and feed it into the TF mask spatial network. And the other element that can be improved is uh, how you generate the enhanced speech uh, you can, because with multiple microphones, you can steer the acoustic, be acoustic uh, orientation towards a specific direction. So you can also use that, uh, use that capability to do speech enhancement or separation. Uh, but this is a known technique, so I'm not going to talk about this NVDR thing. And I will just uh, focus on this input space. And for the input, this, is, this actually improves the accuracy a lot. The, the margin is significant. But one of the problems is that when it comes to production is that uh, once you train a model, this model can, uh, can be used only for a particular microphone array device. And you cannot uh, bring this uh, model for, to any other devices, uh, which is, is a kind of problematic because sometimes the microphone, uh, one of the microphone may actually corrupt, uh, collapse and uh, you can get only a subset of the microphone signal or also if you are working with many other uh, third party devices, you, need, you want to uh, breed in one model that can support all the other uh, devices. So uh, that's why we are working on uh, what we call array geometry agnostic model uh, for microphone array. And the idea here is that once you train a model, it, can, it should be able to apply to any, uh, any other devices. And the idea here is pretty simple. So the problem with the previous approach of stacking, uh, concatenating the features along the frequency dimension uh, is that uh, because uh, if you have four microphones, uh, you have uh, fixed, uh, fixed dimensionality uh, in, the, uh, vertical, uh, in the vertical dimension. So, because now you want the model to be able to, uh, to, be able to deal with uh, a varying number of channels or microphones, 
you want to uh, deal with the channel dimension separately uh, from the rest, uh, the other frequency and time dimensions. So now instead of the 2D representation, you have now 3D tensor as an input. And so, and the, because this channel dimension is also variable, so you can apply uh, some uh, sequential model like, uh, uh, like a self-attention model. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, what we can do, is what we have here is what we call var array block uh, multiple times uh, that try to uh, extract the information uh, spatially and temporally, gradually, uh, by repeating the same block multiple times. And uh, at the end, because we do not need multiple channels, uh, we do mean pooling over channels. And then we do have some, uh, we have some additional conformal blocks to get the time frequency mask for speaker one, speaker two. And this var array block uh, is constructed as follows. So uh, in, uh, uh, first, we, have, uh, we, we view this uh, 3D tensor as uh, multiple, slices of, uh, multiple slices of time frequency representation. And we apply the same conformer a long time so, uh, to transform, uh, do some feature transformation here. And then we spread the time and channel dimension. Now you see this as, as multiple slices of uh, uh, channel by uh, feature uh, map. And uh, this is uh, for, each time frame, for each time frame, you apply the same model, which we call TAC. Actually, you can use any other uh, models, but uh, we, we use this TAC model, uh, which we proposed recently, uh, uh, to do that further transformation along the channel, and then swap the time and uh, channel dimensions again, so that you have the same uh, tensor shape, 3D tensor shape as input. So we just replay, uh, repeat this var array process block multiple times to do a spatial temporal processing. And this uh, TAC is an abbreviation for transform average and concatenate layer. And this was proposed by our previous intern, uh, Ilo. And uh, the basic idea is, it, it's pretty simple. You have multiple channels uh, here, uh, in this case, three channels and you apply a uh, feed for a layer uh, B, uh, and then uh, basically transform the input into some uh, uh, another space, and then calculate the mean pooling uh, to get a sense of what's happening globally uh, across the entire channels. And then concatenate them uh, to individual channels, uh, transform version of individual channels. So it's pretty simple, and uh, it actually works well. And uh, here is the results for uh, the, the comparison of the proposed method uh, with some other methods uh, on AMI uh, development data set and our internal meeting data set. And the, on the AMI data set, uh, so uh, I have multiple uh, uh, com uh, competitors here, but essentially the key message here is the proposed bar array model outperformed all of them uh, on all the data set. And the key point is that we just train a single model and use the same model for all of these uh, configurations. AMI 8 means we use eight microphones of the AMI dataset, uh, which is publicly available. And AMI 4 means we just use uh, four microphones, the first, third, fifth, and seventh microphones for the experiment. And uh, the same applies to our internal meetings. And uh, as you can see, so this BF, by the way, the BF uh, did not have this overlap speed separation. So as you can see, speed separation, all of them produce a different gain compared to just single channel, uh, sorry, a single stream processing. So that shows the benefit of especially multi-channel uh, speed separation. And yeah, uh, that's, a, that's experimental result. And there are a couple of more results. But, uh, okay, so uh, let me briefly talk about this. So uh, the left one uh, described the generalization capability to unseen microphone error geometries. And for example, this blue bar shows a model, is the model trained on only the AMI, AMI uh, microphone array geometry, and then applied uh, to both AMI and our internal meeting data set. And the, so as you can see, this AMI trained model still were able to perform pretty well for the MS, uh, our internal meetings. So which show the generalization capability. So the other, uh, and, uh, but obviously the best, perform the best performance was obtained by combining both, uh, both microphone and geometries during training, 
but still we see a good generation capability to unseen microphones. And uh, on the right side, we, have, we also have end-to-end -end fine tuning with ESR loss. As I mentioned, uh, for the single channel case, we get a good performance improvement by training the model by using ASR loss function. And uh, we could observe the same thing for, uh, for the actual uh, AMID data set, uh, for multi, even for the multi-channel case. All right, so I'm going to skip this one. So I just wanted to mention that uh, this is also being used for in some uh, Microsoft uh, Teams room devices, and uh, so, which is a good thing, I guess. All right, so, all right, before going to the joint approach, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I can check. All right, if not, uh, let me move on to the joint approach. All right, so uh, here I'd like to talk about uh, the basic pros and cons of the joint approach. And uh, before I talk about a modular approach, uh, which is essentially continuous speed separation. And the a nice thing about this modular approach is that you can reuse existing components, uh, like for speech recognition and speaker direction, which is super, super important when it comes to uh, the real usage. Because in a company, there are many people working on only on speech separation, oh, sorry, speech recognition and speaker derivation, and they uh, they continuously improve their models. So we, so there is a, a desire to be able to use that improvement automatically uh, in our system. So modular approach is a good uh, choice from that point of view. But at the same time, in terms of performance, like whether it's accuracy or cost of latency. Uh, it can be suboptimal. Uh, all these components tend to use a very big model, and uh, which add up uh, because it is a modular and just you concatenate them. So uh, from operational point of view, which may, this may not be, uh, this may be suboptimal. On the other hand, with a joint approach, uh, you have a greater room for optimization because everything is modeled as a single gigantic model, and uh, you can kind of internally uh, how do we say, adjust the resource from one area to another. So in, in, in concept, the joint approach should be, should be, the, uh, should be optimal. And at the same time, uh, on the flip side, it is really, really straightforward. It is not straightforward to benefit from the improvement in other modules. Uh, because now you, everything is combined together, so you need to train uh, the model from scratch, uh, which is not very straightforward. So that's the, so in order to justify the use of joint model, we need to be able to show significant improvement compared to a modular approach. So that's the kind of a perspective that we have and trying to show uh, from our results. Okay, so um, for joint approach, uh, there are two things. Uh, there are two concepts that I wanted to introduce. And the first one is serialized output training uh, for overlap speech handling. And so uh, for a joint model, uh, so for end-to-end -end speech recognition, you know, there are mainly uh, two or three approaches. And one is a uh, transducer model, and another one is sequence to sequence model. And uh, we use sequence to sequence model because it is more flexible uh, compared with the transducer. And uh, the idea here is that with sequence to sequence model, so basically it's a, a transduction problem. You have a sequence of audio as an input, uh, which may have one speaker or two speaker or three speaker, and then you try to, uh, you convert that into, uh, uh, into a string of tokens, which represent all the three speakers. And so that's what we want to do. So the question here is how can we represent the multi-talker uh, multi transcription uh, in, as a string of tokens? And uh, it's really simple. Uh, the, the approach is really simple. So if you have three speakers as shown here, uh, W1, W2, W3, uh, what we do is just concatenate the transcriptions uh, in chronological order or in other words, uh, first in, first out, uh, FIFO. And uh, so in this example, uh, the W1 comes first, and uh, we insert a special symbol called SC, uh, which represents uh, speaker change. And then uh, I have uh, W2 here, and again I have speaker change SC, and W3, and uh, finally 
And in order to represent the fact that I already consumed all the spoken content in the input, I use the EOS end of sentence. And uh, one thing to note, it does not to note that is it is possible that W2 actually starts uh, in the middle of W1, uh, which means that there are overlap between uh, speaker one and speaker two. And uh, basically, we do not care whether these two, uh, these two speakers are overlap or not. Basically, what we want to do is to, we just uh, to, 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 to concatenate the transcriptions uh, in, uh, in, the, in the time order and then uh, ask the network to, uh, to, tr uh, to tr do the transcription for all of them. So that is the basic idea of serial output training, uh, which we proposed uh, uh, two, I think two years ago maybe three, uh, uh, two years ago. <laughs> All right, and so uh, that's, okay, so and this SOT uh, does not have an element of prioritization. And now what we want to do uh, toward the end-to-end -end modeling is add the speaker, uh, is to add speaker attribution element to this framework. And so the diagram is a little bit complicated, but essentially it is doing is simple. So what we want to do is that, oh, so before that, uh, in order to speaker diarization, we introduce a set of speaker profiles, basically, so for each person, attending person, we assume that we have a profile, a, a, a vocal profile for each person. And, uh, and this kind of profile, set of profiles can be obtained by prior speaker crossing using already existing techniques like uh, a speaker diarization or some uh, enrollment process. And so uh, by introducing this uh, speaker profiles, so uh, the speech, this diarization rotation problem can be defined as a classification rather than a kind of generation task. And so, uh, and then with this model, what, we, we do, what, what I want to do is at the input, we have the input acoustic signal X and uh, the speaker profile D. And given this information, we want to inf uh, increase, uh, maximize the posterior probability of the token sequence, which represents the words, and the speaker ID sequence. And the uh, speaker ID is defined for each output token. So basically there is a pair, so uh, it's a sequence of pairs of uh, uh, output token and speaker ID. And this can be decomposed uh, using Bayes rule, uh, not Bayes, uh, by using chain rule. Uh, uh, in this way. So you can decompose this into the ASR part and speaker part. And ASR part depends on the current token speaker decision and the speaker decision is dependent on the past uh, output sequence for both, uh, for both ASR and, speak, uh, and speakers. So, so if you look at this diagram, basically, uh, so this left branch corresponds to ASR part and the right branch uh, corresponds to uh, the speaker, uh, speaker decoder. And the ASR decoder, uh, so this ASR uh, branch is essentially the same as existing uh, sequence to sequence or speech recursion model. So you have ASR encoder, which, is based, which now is based on transformer. And also you have ASR decoder, which is based on mask, uh, based on trans another transformer, which is a mask, uh, mask attention. And then uh, the only difference is that you have additional input at the bottom of this decoder uh, from the deco uh, from the from the speaker side, so that you can guide the uh, you can some you can have some influence on the ASR output from the speaker side. And on the speaker side, we also have this, uh, the transformer, actually conformer, for speaker encoder and speaker decoder. And by speaker decoder, what it's doing is to generate a speaker query. Uh, and essentially, so at the end, what we want is to give a speaker probability for each element in, the, in this set of speaker profiles, right? And in order to do that, we wanted to have some speaker query uh, that, is applied, uh, that is applied to the speaker profiles. And then you can calculate the cosine similarity with each of them uh, to produce the speaker ID probabilities with softmax. And this speaker uh, decoder try to produce a speaker query. Uh, from the transformer uh, network. So that is the overall architecture. And uh, okay, and we did uh, evaluation, comparison evaluation of three models. One is this joint model, and uh, an another other two are uh, this modular approach, 
where we use CSS in the uh, continuous speech separation in the front end, and we did the uh, diarization based on that. And another, the, the simplest one is the, uh, the, con uh, the conventional speech separation, sorry, conventional speaker uh, diarization and speech recognition system, which does not handle overlap speech. And uh, we did the evaluation using the AMI single distance microphone data set. And uh, we have the dev set evaluation results and eval set results uh, on the right side. And as you can clearly see, without overlap modeling, uh, it, oh, and uh, this is a CP word rate, uh, which, uh, uh, which refers to concatenated permutation or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. Uh, uh, I but, hate it, but I forgot it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so which uh, essentially, uh, uh, which basically uh, captures both uh, speaker errors and uh, speech recognition errors. So this is a mixed, uh, uh, mixed error metric. And uh, so without any overlap modeling, uh, you get, uh, in, in the case of DevSet, 28.6% uh, 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 CP word error rate. And with the modular approach, uh, it was impro improved to 24.8. But with the joint approach, uh, you could, uh, we could get further performance boosts, uh, nice performance gains. And uh, it was uh, more significant in the, depth, uh, in the evaluation data set, which shows uh, uh, the generalization capability of the model as well. So uh, that's the experimental results that we wanted to show. And, uh, and here are a couple of concluding remarks uh, that I want to mention. And the first one is, uh, I, I first talk about the modular approach. And uh, for modular approach, basically, uh, it is a front-end based approach, uh, which can be done independently from ASR and uh, speaker validation. And uh, to do that, we developed uh, a concept called continuous speech separation, and it can be used as a front-end. And uh, also for the multi-channel application, uh, we propose a geometry agnostic modeling, uh, which can be used for any microphone arrays uh, with a single model, which is super, uh, super helpful in reality. And uh, the second approach, which I mentioned, is the joint approach. And it was shown to outperform the modular approach, actually, uh, with the nice margin uh, under a fair comparison setting. Uh, Actually, when it comes to production, uh, with the modular approach, you can take advantage of other speech recognition models, uh, which is uh, trained by, uh, by other people, and uh, so which is another thing that needs to be overcome uh, with the joint approach. But uh, at least uh, the joint approach shows a very big, uh, very good pro uh, promising result, and uh, we continue working on that. And uh, obviously, and uh, the important message that I wanted to uh, say is that both approaches improve the rate for real meetings without any prior knowledge information, like speaker segmentation and speech, uh, speaker segmentation and speaker information. And uh, some of them are actually being used for actual, uh, in, in the actual uh, product offerings. All right, and uh, finally, uh, in order to kind of stimulate the discussion, or uh, I wanted to leave a couple of questions for future work. And uh, there are many questions that I wanted to, uh, that I have right now. The first one is, can we ac apply, so we apply this to meetings, but can we apply the same approach to more challenging uh, tasks like uh, Chime 6, which is organized by uh, Shinji Professor Watanabe uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion? So that's uh, one of the questions uh, that uh, we are thinking. And, and the second question is, so in reality, so for like uh, publicly available data set like AMI, uh, it is really clean uh, and uh, the transcription is really clean. Uh, but uh, in reality, you get only the uh, far field, for example, a single channel recording. And you ask, if you ask the human transcriber to ask these, uh, to, 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 to do the transcription, for example, for the training or violation, uh, people really find it difficult to do transcription for overlap segments. And uh, they tend to uh, uh, use some special symbols like unintelligible or overlap or something like that and just give up. So we need to be able to use some, uh, it would be even nicer to be able to use the unlabeled real recordings directly instead of uh, doing the, transcript, uh, the supervised transcription. And uh, the third one is, can we do a streaming model uh, for the joint approach? Uh, I use the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, which is essentially a 
segment-based uh, at the best segment-based processing. But the question is, can we do streaming model uh, for that? And the first question is, uh, can we use uh, uh, those front-end techniques for like video conferencing? Uh, I can see that some of people are uh, connecting remotely uh, to this uh, to this uh, to this session. Uh, and uh, can we do uh, the can we do uh, use some of the technique to improve the uh, audio quality uh, for video conferencing? And the final question is. It is our belief that uh, it is super important to work on this. I, I showed the Venn diagram where I have speech recognition and uh, speaker diarization, and uh, speech separation. And uh, I sh said that it's important to uh, work on the intersection. But actually, I believe it is important. But uh, it's really hard to deal with the system complexity. And also, data scale is also essential to achieve the good performance. So the question is, is there a way to kind of advance the state of the art in the broader community uh, in a healthy way, the more efficiently? So these are the questions that I have. And yeah, and with that, uh, I have some pointers uh, to our, some of the papers. So if you're interested, just let me know. I can uh, share the slides. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. That's true. Yes, token, right? Mm -hmm. And then this means that this speaker decoder, speaker detection is actually performed by, by token by token. Yes. Not like frame by frame. That's right. And uh, do, you said that it's the, the dialization, so I was a bit confused. Mm -hmm. So that, do you have some way to recover the timestamp? Oh, I see. Then, OK, uh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's a very good point. So in that sense, this is slightly different from uh, what is called diarization. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when you say diarization, it is true that uh, you also want to give the timestamps uh -huh. for each utterance. Uh, currently, with this particular model, we are not given the timestamp. And uh, we submitted a paper to ICAF, and uh, we submitted to Archive uh, very recently uh, another uh, paper uh, trying to do also diarization, the real diarization nice. So. And the idea there is that you have this model, and uh, we can add. Uh, so, uh, so initially we have this uh, speaker attributed transcription model. Mm -hmm. So we call it speaker attribution uh, instead of diarization. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a, uh, a couple of additional layers uh, to uh, to give a speaker so, uh, the timestamps for the yeah. beginning and the end of the utterance. And uh, that's uh, what we did for the speaker diarization mm -hmm. Uh and uh, we show some uh, good results over there. So that's, uh, yeah, so thank you for that. I see, I see. And uh, I, I have uh, another mm -hmm. question. Um, why not just throw it to the RN transducer? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, even, you know, I know that it's, you know, uh, the RN transducer uh, the assuming the monotonic right. uh, property. Mm -hmm. If we're using uh, self-attention and whatever, internally self-attention actually can uh, the, uh, the make the kind of uh, order uh, problem mm -hmm. uh, to be adjusted. So, uh, the, yeah, entirely different order. So it might, I'm not sure it might not work, mm -hmm. but the theoretically in the mathematical uh, the self-attention ability, actually it can make it work. And mm -hmm. then the RN transducer, given, you know, self-attention is reordering the stuff, mm -hmm. and then RN transducer is working, mm -hmm. and then we can also do the, uh, the streaming and so on, right? Th did you try that kind of uh, thing? No, we are, so uh, actually, so uh, I, yeah, so that's a good point, and uh, it should be possible, uh, mm -hmm. especially if you don't care about the actual latency of the system. Uh -huh. So uh, the system works streaming, but uh, the, the, the latency between uh, when the, uh, someone speaks a particular word and that particular word comes out at, at the output may be very different, uh, oh, even yeah, if you maybe. are in transducer. But essentially, uh, definitely, it should be possible. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, so 
what we want is, but uh, from streaming mode is uh, actually some low latency, <laughs> low latency yeah. output. Yeah. So I think it would be even better to uh -huh. think about a better way to, uh, how to say, a way to control the latency, mm -hmm. even for uh, overlapped regions. Okay. So that's what we are actually thinking about. But uh, at this moment, we don't have a good, uh, okay. uh, good way to deal with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a good point, and uh, I I guess I mostly skipped that <laughs> the, the details. So uh, so uh, in conclusion, uh, the performance of the this fixed array. So uh, let me call it fixed array model, where you know the array information about the array geometry at t uh, training time, and uh, this is a result. Uh, so if you look at the AMI results, for example, AMI eight. So this uh, dark blue, uh, which is a little hard to see, but 18.8 is the result from the fixed array model, uh, and which was particularly trained for a particular model, and 17.7 is the var array model. And the reason for this performance gap are, uh, I think there are two, uh, two elements to it. And the first element is that uh, this var array model uh, used uh, a more variety of data set compared to this fixed array model. With fixed array model, you not only know the number of microphones, but also the microphone order of this particular microphone. You call, uh, the, for example, the center microphone as mic zero, and, and then you do clockwise, mic one, mic two, mic three. And uh, this kind of limit the variability of the training data set Although if you, for example, significantly increase the amount of training data set, maybe you can overcome, but uh, with the same amount of data set, you have limited uh, spatial variability, which may be the reason, uh, one of the reasons for this performance gap between this one and this one. And another difference is this fixed array model. Uh, oh, yeah, so that, is, that could be the main reason. But uh, so essentially, uh, so there are a lot of, uh, Ex internal experiments that we did, uh, which was not shown here. But if you do pretty well uh, with the fixed array, uh, you can get almost the same number as this var array. But still, uh, this, uh, essentially you do not need to use any uh, microphone error geometry if you use a good uh, feature representation and a good model uh, for, to deal with uh, multiple devices. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, right, and uh, there is some mismatch, and uh, that's so uh, for all of these results. I didn't, although I didn't mention actually. Uh, okay, uh, let me start with this one because I already have the result. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, so uh, for the multi-channel, I use the uh, simulated data uh, to kind of pre-train a model, uh, pre-train the speed separation model. And if I have uh, 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 the real data and the transcription for that, we can use that to find further fine-tune the model, right? And uh, this is a result. Uh, and this is a result on uh, ME meeting data set uh, for development data set and evaluation data set. And, uh, as you can see, if we do this fine tuning on the same AMI data set, uh, we can get a reasonable gain, uh, especially for the depth set. So which shows uh, that there could be some, uh, some mismatch, data mismatch between the simulated environment and the real environment. And this is the result for multi-channel uh, because multi-channel model relies heavily on the spatial acoustics. This fine tuning is not super, super important, but for like end-to-end uh, -end model, uh, this becomes more important, like this one. And uh, during training, what we do is we first use the uh, gigantic amount of simulated data. Uh, basically, we have a lot of ASR training data, uh, which is uh, essentially single speaker segment, and then uh, concatenate them together uh, to form a training sample uh, to pre-train the model. 
And then after the free training, uh, we have, uh, we, uh, because we have some real data set from the AMI data set, so we fine tune uh, the, this pre trained model with the uh, AMI data set, which actually boosts the performance, especially for the single channel case. So, in that sense, uh, we are actually doing that, and it's really helpful to uh, boost the performance.